Good morning. I'm Dr. Jeffrey Hayes, Education Specialist for the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. Welcome to the latest presentation of the ASRM Grand Rounds webinar series. These webinars are designed to address topics in the ABOG Guide to Learning in Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility. Today's presentation will be given by Dr. Dolores J. Lamb. Dr. Lamb is currently director at the Center for Reproductive Medicine and the Lester and Sue Smith Chair in Urologic Research at the Baylor College of Medicine. The title of her talk today is Y Chromosome. I will now review the details of today's presentation. After the webinar is done, please do not forget to return to ASRM eLearn to take the post-test and complete the survey for your continuing education credit. You must complete the post-test question successfully and complete the survey to receive credit and be able to print off your certificate. If you wish to ask a question to the speaker about the presentation, when you return to ASRM eLearn, click on the page link labeled Questions, and an email address will be provided. After the time period for questions has expired, the questions page will become a frequently asked questions page pertaining to this presentation and topic. Our speaker today is Dr. Dolores J. Lamb. We are very excited for her talk, so I will now turn things over to Dr. Lamb. Thank you very much. So uh, these are my disclosures. None of them are relevant to the topic of this lecture. There are many well-recognized causes of human infertility, and one of the most common are chromosomal defects. And today, my lecture will focus on one specific structural chromosomal defect uh, that occurs in men. Now this slide shows you a normal male karyotype where the chromosomes are visualized. We can see that there are many ways to do a karyotype. This is a high resolution banding karyotype analysis. This is a spectral karyotype. The information that we get from both are similar. Essentially, in this karyotype, we can see that all of the chromosomes are present and normal men would have 22 pairs of autosomes and one set of sex chromosomes with the Y chromosome being male determining. Well, what does this information tell us from a karyotype? Essentially, it's analogous to going to the library, which none of us do anymore, and looking at the Encyclopedia Britannica. We can see that all of the volumes are present um, in the, the library. They seem to be about of the right size. And similarly, a karyotype is telling us that all of the chromosomes are present. They are approximately of the right size. And we can even see when bits of the chromosomes, but they're fairly large pieces of chromosome, are translocated or missing. And again, we can see whether or not it's a male or female by looking at the sex chromosomes, the X and the Y, and the male with the Y being male determining, and the two X chromosomes present in the human, uh, in the female. But this is a very superficial look at our genetic information. However, simply by doing this very simple analysis, we can see that a karyotype reveals that chromosomal abnormalities are present in infertile men as compared to fertile men. Unselected infertile men with no other diagnostic criteria have an incidence of about 6% chromosomal abnormalities, which is about tenfold more common than that is found in the normal population, as shown in this slide right, right here. Now, if we look a little closer, this publication is from my laboratory, uh, looking at uh, the types of chromosomal abnormalities that are present in fertile and infertile men. We can see that um, as sperm production becomes increasingly worse, um, that we see increased incidences of various types of chromosome abnormalities with numerical sex chromosome abnormalities being most common in azospermic men. So this would be, for example, a Kleinfelter patient with XXY karyotype, whereas structural abnormalities, as shown right here, are more common in severely oligospermic men, and these can involve either the uh, these are on the autosomes. There are also defects of structural sex chromosome abnormalities, which are present 
in infertile men, and importantly, even infertile men with normal zoospermia, meaning they have normal semen parameters, have a significantly increased incidence of abnormal cytogenetic findings when compared to fertile men. And again, just to remind you, about a half percent of fertile men have abnormal cytogenetic findings, whereas um, for some of our pathologies, between um, 9 and un and even uh, about 13 percent of azoospermic men have um, increased incidences of chromosomal anomalies. So again, this is a very significant increase when compared to fertile men. Well, I'm going to focus my talk today on structural chromosomal abnormalities. And there are many molecular techniques to um, look at structural changes in the human genome. Again, here is the karyotype analysis. And on the left side here, I'm showing you the sensitivity of the various types of analyses for detecting large defects. Um, and so this would be, um, this is the number of base pairs. This would be down to looking at a, the single base pair change, as we discussed, such as a, a isolated mutation. Whereas here, we're looking at large pieces of chromosomes um, missing or duplicated. So that would be the karyotype, as you can see with the detection level um, here of less than uh, 10 to the fifth base pairs. Um, fluorescent in situ hybridization is shown here. We, we use this for doing sperm uh, fish for aneuploidy. And southern blot is not employed commonly these days in the clinical genetics lab. However, PCR-based methods as well as microarray-based methods, this would be considered to be a molecular karyotype, are certainly used in the diagnosis of infertile men. And more recently, we have next generation sequencing where Every uh, base pair in a human's genome can be sequenced and examined for the presence of mutations. So I thought it would be worthwhile just to see um, first about what, what is the history of uh, the genetics of the Y chromosome. And in 1891, Herman Hanking first proposed the no notion that there was a unique sex-determining chromosome, and he was working on WASP spermatogenesis. And um, then several years later, C.E. McClung showed that there was a 12th accessory chromosome in grasshopper sperm. People worked on insects at that time trying to understand genetics um, and the DNA present in sperm. And he observed that they segregated unequally during meiosis. And so, and he also noted that there was a sex difference between the zygotes. Um, and from this, this resulted from variable segregation. So in other words, he was first identifying the fact that um, the different sexes of the, of the grasshoppers had different chromosomal complements, um, again, resulting from the presence of the, ex the sex-determining chromosomes. Now then in 1902, Walter Sutton showed that gametes have a half, half the chromosomal material as zygotes. So in other words, he, he indicated that the gametes had a haploid complement of chromosomes. And then I think in really a landmark paper, E.B. Wilson realized that one uh, set of chromosomes differed in one of the one of the chromosomes differed in size between males and females, and this was in 1905. Again, she was looking um, at um, insects, but she was the one who proposed that one of these chromosomes was the male determinant and one was the female determinant, and this provided the basis for today's nomenclature where the females have two X chromosomes and the male has an X and a Y chromosome. And then it wasn't until the 1950s that the correct number of human chromosomes was even known. It was really, again, a turning point in the field of medical genetics. And um, for many, many decades prior to that time, it was believed that human cells had 48 chromosomes. Um, and by properly distinguishing the proper number of chromosomes, he was able to then um, provide information as to what was normal and what was abnormal in humans. Now here in the Texas Medical Center where I'm located, Stick and Shoe, and Shoe 
observed the Y chromosome wasn't just present in gametes, but also present in somatic cell cells. And then about 30 years later, Sinclair identified the first gene um, that was present um, on the Y chromosome, uh, which, which is the sex-determining region of the Y. And it was the long sought after testis determining factor in male. There had been many uh, investigators trying to identify what gene it was that was uh, te testis determining and, and defined maleness. And then in 1992, the Y chromosome was sequenced by David Page's laboratory in a series of publications um, that were really, again, landmark um, reports in terms of improving our understanding of the Y chromosome. Now, the SRY gene, the, the sex determining region Y gene, uh, is located on the short arm right here of the Y chromosome. Here we're looking at the Y chromosome expanded. And again, it's here, uh, right here in this region of the short arm of the Y chromosome. And this is an important gene to remember because deletions result in disorders of sexual differentiation, giving rise to the, um, the XY, SRY minus female. Uh, and whereas translocations can result in disorders of sexual differentiation, and in this case it would be an, a 46XX SRY positive XX male, uh, neither of these individuals would have um, any sperm present on a testis biopsy for use with an assisted reproductive technology. So let's look a little closer at the structural defects on the Y chromosome. And again, remember that this would be analogous to abnormal chapters or paragraphs in a book. These abnormalities can be translocations or inversions or deletions. They can occur on both the um, autosomal um, chromosomes as well as the sex chromosomes. But we're going to fo focus our talk today on on the Y chromosome. Now, in 1976, two cytogeneticists were studying the Y chromosome, again, using a karyotype uh, analysis to study patients with azospermia. And they observed that a subset of men with uh, non-obstructive azospermia had um, deletions in the long arm of the, of the Y chromosome. Here again, you can see SRY, right, um, on the short arm of the Y chromosome. But these deletions occurred in, in this region right here. These were large deletions because they were visible um, on a karyotype analysis. And that led these authors, Tipolo and Zafardi, to uh, to term this region the AZF region uh, for azospermia factor region. Um, and it took another 20 years um, for Renee Reho working in David Page's lab to identify the first uh, putative uh, spermatogenesis gene in this region that deleted an azospermia gene or DAS gene. And so Today, we have molecular technologies using the microarray uh, technology to see small deletions that are not visible by microscopy. So again, if we go back to our encyclopedia analogy, this would be analogous to deletions of pages of a chapter. Now, Y chromosome microdeletions are very common um, in uh, non-obstructive azospermic men. Um, you can see with the incidence being highest in men with Sertoli cell only syndrome. And as sperm production uh, levels improve, you can see that the frequency of seeing Y chromosome microdeletions. Uh, here we have simply unselected um, oligospermic males and unselected infertile males. You can see that they have a lower incidence of uh, karyotype, of, excuse me, of Y chromosome microdeletions as compared to the non-obstructive azospermic male with Sertoli cell only. Important to realize that we can't even see the frequency because it is so incredibly low of these deletions um, in normal fertile men. 
And it's generally accepted that Y-chromosome microdeletions occur in about 8 to 12 percent of non-obstructive azoospermic men, uh, and about 6 percent of oligozoospermic men. It is rare um, in fertile men. Well, why do these Y-chromosome microdeletions occur? The Y, the, the y Y chromosome Q11 band is of importance in evaluating the genetic causes of male infertility. It possesses genes essential for spermatogenesis, but it's very error prone, as we will see, due to an abundance of what's called palindromic sequences. So these are mirror image genomic sequences of similar polarity that comprise almost a quarter of this region of the Y chromosome. Now we can see this schematically here, where we're looking at the Y chromosome. Now just to remind you um, that the Y chromosome microdeletions are located on the long arm here of the Y chromosome. This entire region from the short arm here uh, to, the short arm, to the long arm here is termed the male specific region. This is 95% of the um, of the Y chromosome, and this does not undergo homologous recombination with the X chromosome during meiosis, which occurs on all other autosomal chromosomes. Now, what is also unique is that at the tips of the Y chromosome, so this is pseudo-autosomal region, or PAR1, at the tip of the short arm, and pseudo-autosomal region, or PAR2, at the tip of the long arm, do recombine and undergo homologous recombination with the X chromosome. And this is very unique, again, to the sex chromosomes. Now, within the male-specific Y region, as I mentioned earlier, there are a number of these palindromic sequences. And if we look based on color, um, these sequences here in green um, would be homologous to each other in the opposite orientation. Um, here we have, again, a palindrome in this region right here. And there are very specific rate points and recombination points that define the microdeletions that are found in non-obstructive azoospermic patients. Now here we're looking schematically at the long arm of the Y chromosome. Um, since uh, Tipolo and Zafardi's identification of the AZF region um, on the long arm of the Y chromosome, we now see that this region can be subdivided into AZFA, AZFB, and AZFC. And what is denoted here are the markers that are used to amplify these regions, the STS, or sequence tag sites, that provided landmarks for, uh, for the various structures of this chromosomal region. But it's important to realize that the AZF region encompasses more than just the deleted in azospermia gene, which is found right here, which is located in the AZFC region. And clinically, this is important to realize because deletions in AZFA and or AZFB um, predict an incredibly poor likelihood for sperm retrieval. And indeed, I think that there are uh, no reports of sperm being found on testicular sperm extraction uh, in patients with non-obstructive azoospermia with deletions of either AZFA and or AZFB. So this is very important to know clinically where the microdeletion is that your patient has. Deletions in AZFC uh, portend a greater likelihood of being able to identify Y chromosome, to identify rare sperm on a testis biopsy. Now, these Y chromosome microdeletions are examples of genomic diseases. So these are copy number variants that result in gene dosage changes. Now, if we think about the simplest example, which would be looking at um, a copy number variant or gene dosage change on an autosomal chromosome, we normally have two copies of a gene, one inherited from our mother, 
one inherited from our father, and two copies would be normal. In some cases, three copies may be um, present in an individual where one copy is inherited again as it should be from one parent, but two copies are inherited in error from the other parent. That would be unbalanced. And in other cases, we see the reciprocal type of problem where, again, one copy is inherited from one parent as it should be, no copies, a complete deletion of the gene from one of the parents is inherited, and this is, again, abnormal. This is considered a microdeletion. This is considered a microduplication. Now, please remember that for the um, for most of the Y chromosome microdeletions, they are occurring in the male specific Y region where we have only one copy of a gene. So in this case, for example, um, if we have a microdeletion of the Y chromosome deleting the DAS or deleted an azospermia gene, we have no copies of that gene and no protein from the deleted an azospermia gene being expressed. So why does this occur? This occurs uh, during homologous recombination during meiosis in the parent. Um, and again, these are copy number variations of genes, or CNVs. And this occurs during meiosis when we see the chromosomes from the, the father uh, originally and from the mother. And this is very simplistic where the chromosomes come together at meiosis, they have to synapse, they have to cross over, and then they have to undergo segregation. Um, and in this way, the gene pool is mixed um, uh, uh, between the different chromosomes. And this is what normally happens during meiosis, and this is what um, is important in evolution. However, when we see when we end up with unequal crossovers, um, you can see that um, instead of segregating and properly getting um, the mixture of DNA from both uh, chromosomes that the individual has, we end up in the gametes with one gamete, which is missing part of the chromosome, and here a duplication gamete, where there's a duplication of the region because it has two copies here and here, rather, and this one has no copies. Um, and so we have two copies here, no copies here. This is a deletion. This is a duplication. This would be an example of a Y chromosome uh, microdeletion here. And how often this occurs um, depends on many things. There can be hot spots for crossovers, so with genomic diseases of which Y chromosome microdeletions are one. Um, many of these on um, autosomal chromosomes have specific structural motifs that predispose to these types of aberrant crossovers. There can be repetitive sequence areas, such as, again, we see in the Y chromosome. Um, and um, sometimes uh, these genes are either um, incompatible with a life of, a, of an, a fetus at all, or perhaps it may be incompatible with fertility, such as with the Y chromosome. Now, this is to show you schematically um, how these deletions occur. Again, remember that here are the two pseudo-autosomal regions on the tips of the short arm and the long arm of the Y chromosome. And um, you can see here, uh, here are the copies of the deleted and azospermia gene. And there are a number of classic microdeletions that are seen in men with non-obstructive azospermia that, again, result from these palindromic regions. And so we see that um, actually that the AZFB region, first thought to be totally uh, distinct from the AZFC region, can actually overlap um, in terms of a microdeletion, cutting this entire region of the long arm of the Y chromosome, uh, resulting in a large uh, deletion encompassing AZFB plus some of what was originally called AZFC. 
There are two specific variants of that, whether it's the deletion is from here uh, to the tip here, or whether the deletion is from here to here. Now there's also a region of duplication, which is seen in this region, which is the AZF uh, region for, again, microdeletion as well, but duplications can be observed as well. And there's another region here which can undergo inversions of the, of the sequence of the chromosomes. Now if we look at this schematically again, just so you can get a sense of how this occurs, these palindromic regions, which I have numbered for you here, uh, palindrome 1 through 8, uh, results in the formation of hairpin loops in the chromosomes. All right, and so, so these are looping structures, and these then are edited out and lost. Um, so for example, um, a man with a large deletion um, here at P1 will be losing his DAS copies as well as some other genes on the Y chromosome. This deletion deletes only the DAS gene and here there are other spermatogenesis required genes and other genes um, on the, the Y chromosome which can be deleted in patients with Y chromosome microdeletions. Some of these regions are not important in terms of, uh, of looking at infertility, whereas these other green genes shown here um, are all um, relative to uh, testis-specific expression. Again, this is showing you that same information, again, schematically, where you can see this is the long, uh, the large AZFB deletion, again, which is encompassing this entire region here. Uh, between these palindromic structures. Um, here you have the deletion of the even longer one um, from this palindrome uh, to here. And this is the more classic AZFC deletion here, which is deleting uh, from this region to this region. Um, and this is deleting the deleted and azospermia gene. We also hear about the GRGR deletion which is controversial in terms of its role in non-obstructive azospermia and male infertility. Um, but again, this is a deleted region as well between these palindromes. So who should be tested for Y chromosome microdeletions? All men with non-obstructive azospermia seeking to achieve a pregnancy with testicular sperm extraction and ICSI, as well as severely oligospermic men. And it's important to remember that if an assisted reproductive technique is used uh, for men with Y chromosome microdeletions, the Y chromosome microdeletions will be inherited by the male offspring conceived by ICSI, and so certainly they will be infertile with a similar spermatogenic deficiency um, as present um, in the father. And some couples might opt for uh, gender selection uh, to only then conceive female offspring, but others, others don't make that um, decision. Now, uh, in Europe, uh, this is from a publication by Silla Krauss. Um, this would be on the top part, this is their flowchart for, um, for diagnosing patients with uh, either uh, non-obstructive azospermia or severe oligospermia in terms of their uh, basic analysis looking at a number of sites on the Y chromosome. These are less sites than are commonly used in the United States. And um, this is the simplistic analysis. They go on to more expensive, extensive mapping of the various deletions. Um, most laboratories in the United States are performing this type of analysis to begin with, and so you have a more complete um, ability to diagnose your patients um, where um, you see either a complete AZFA or, and or AZFB deletion where you have virtually no chance of finding sperm on a testis biopsy. Those men, again, with a complete AZFC deletion, you can find sperm rare sperm with careful uh, microdissection in about half of the men uh, with this shorter deletion encompassing only AZFC. 
Well, what are the other potential implications of these Y chromosome um, gene dosage changes beyond male infertility? Now, uh, in a very interesting paper from David Page's lab, he discussed how there are other genes um, expressed in the testis um, encoded on the Y chromosome, SRY, RBMY, TSPY, and HSFX, which diverged in function to have specific roles in spermatogenesis. Uh, and uh, these are distinct from their copies on the X, that were originally on the X chromosome. Remember I said that the male-specific Y does not recombine with the X. There are also global regulators of gene activity. So you can think of them as kind of a rheostat um, that exists as both X encoded and Y encoded. So that would be male and specific protein isoforms that are expressed in many, many tissues. And these are listed for you here. Um, and essentially, these individual uh, genes, again, act as rheostats um, and um, are differentially expressed between males and females in somatic tissues. And the presence of this type of sexual dimorphism in gene expression may impact health and disease through phenotypic differences between the sexes. So it may be able to uh, provide some information um, about um, gender-specific differences in the development of a number of different diseases um, not considered to be um, important in terms of spermatogenesis. Well, what are the potential implications of Y chromosome CNBs beyond male infertility? This is another example. There are a number of different uh, publications in the literature which have reported altered ICSI IVF outcomes in men with non-obstructive azospermia due to Y chromosome microdeletions. Now, although there was no difference in the fertilization rate seen um, with TESI ICSI, so in other words, once you find these rare sperm on a testis biopsy for use um, in intracytoplasmic sperm injection um, IVF setting, um, the fertilization rate is no different from men um, where you're using ejaculated sperm. But what is seen is impaired blastocyst rates that are associated with Y chromosome microdeletions. And the embryos from these men with Y chromosome microdeletions also had the highest percentage of chromosomally abnormal embryos diagnosed by um, PGS pre-implantation genetic screening for all the chromosomes analyzed. So again, um, there are other anomalies beyond the Y chromosome microdeletion that have occurred in these embryos conceived by men with rare sperm found on a testis biopsy um, and who had Y chromosome microdeletions. And embryos from men with Y chromosome microdeletions had a significantly increased percentage also of embryos that had a monosomy X as compared with embryos from patients without Y chromosome microdeletions. So again, um, there's increasing evidence that there may be altered ICSI IVF outcomes uh, when using sperm from men with Y chromosome microdeletions found on test. Uh, testicular sperm extraction. Now, there are also several publications in the literature that report recurrent pregnancy loss is associated with Y chromosome microdeletion. I've listed for you here um, a number of these publications. Not all investigators agree um, that this is true. Um, and so this is certainly um, an area for increased uh, research need. But be aware that this is a possibility. Um, and um, um, stay tuned to see what, um, what publications will reveal in the near future. It's an area of active research. Now, there are other potential implications of Y chromosome CNVs beyond male infertility for the patient as well. My laboratory reported that shock syndrome is associated with Y chromosome microdeletions in a subset of men. So remember that, um, that 
laboratories today to diagnose Y chromosome microdeletions essentially use PCR-based methods, amplifying regions identified by the STSs that we saw earlier, the markers on the chromosome that span the Y chromosome, uh, to identify the presence or absence of, of regions of the Y chromosome. But today we have um, array-based methods that allow us to do a very defined molecular karyotype and to do this either genome-wide or chromosome-wide and to have a much closer look um, at the structure of the Y chromosome and the sequences which are present um, in individual men. So we use this type of molecular karyotype to examine um, men um, with Y chromosome microdeletions and to look at copy number variations. And we were looking more closely specifically at the X and Y chromosome. Again, this is an array-based technology where we had the, uh, the men with Y chromosome microdeletions as compared to the control men. Uh, and um, we essentially take the DNA, label it with a fluorescent dye, either green or red, and then hybridize this to oligonucleotide probes um, on, a, um, on a chip. And then um, we do fluorescence detection where we can identify this is where two copies of the gene are present as they should be, uh, fluorescing yellow, which is the combination of equal quantities of green and red. But if we have a dosage loss, um, then we see predominantly the red color fluorescence. And if we have a dosage uh, gain, we see the gain of, of that DNA in fluorescent green. So this gives us a very easy way to map um, gains and losses on the Y chromosome. And so um, again, this is showing you the sch schematic of the X and the y whoops, X and Y chromosome. And it's giving us um, then a reminder of the pseudo-autosomal regions of the Y chromosome and the X chromosome. So remember that these are the re regions here, pseudo-autosomal region 1 on the short arm of the X and Y chromosome and pseudo-autosomal region 2 on the long arm of the Y chromosome. These are the regions that, again, undergo homologous recombination during meiosis. And when everyone was so interested in looking not only at the SRY gene on the short arm of the Y chromosome, as well as the genes in the AZF region of the Y chromosome, no one had looked ever to see whether there were defects as well in the pseudo-autosomal regions in men with Y chromosome microdeletions. And I'm going to tell you a story about um, one gene um, on pseudo-autosomal region 1, the Shox gene, which is um, a short homeobox uh, gene associated with stature. And so these are skeletal disorders characterized by either short or in some um, genetic um, mixtures, sometimes extremely st tall stature. And so when we did this type of uh, molecular karyotype of Y chromosome microdeleted men, we found that some of these men also had gene dosage changes in the pseudo-autosomal region 1, the tip of the short arm of the uh, Y chromosome, um, that would lead to them having a genetic syndrome called shock syndrome. This is the data for you here. Um, so we have 143 control fertile men uh, without any Y chromosome microdeletions. And here are 77 patients uh, that had Y chromosome microdeletions identified by a PCR-based assay. Here we performed the molecular karyotype, and we saw abnormalities in both the um, pseudo-autosomal region 1 on the short arm of the Y chromosome, as well as men with problems in both the short arm PAR region, as well as the long arm tip of the Y chromosome. And um, men with shock syndrome or women have uh, one copy of the shox gene because they're missing the second copy. Uh, normal individuals should have two copies of the shox gene, one on the X chromosome, one on the Y chromosome. And in some men, uh, they have three copies or a gain 
of shocks um, with Y chromosome microdeletion. And so what we found was that 14% of the men with uh, non-obstructive azoospermia who had Y chromosome microdeletions had either a loss of shocks um, or a gain of shocks. Well, what does this mean for the patient? So shock syndrome is a very well-recognized syndrome. Um, it's present in women uh, who have Turner syndrome. Uh, it's also present um, in patients with mutations in the shock gene or loss of copy number loss or gain of the shock gene. So having the loss of one copy of shocks or a damaging mutation of shocks leads to Larry Weil syndrome, uh, which is what is seen here. Again, you see a Turner-like body habitus. You see mesomelic short stature and a mad lung deformity of the wrist. You can see the very strange wrist structure here. We can see on an x-ray the, the mad lung deformity being present on the wrist, as well as the presence of a bowed radi radius. Now, when you have homozygous mutations um, or homozygous copy number loss, um, this would be, um, leads to an even more severe phenotype seen in these two children right here with Langer mesomelic dwarfism. Now, when patients have a duplication or an extra copy of shock syndrome, they can have either extremely tall stature uh, with that extra copy number, um, or they can have short stature and have this appearance if the extra copy number interrupted one of the genes that was duplicated. And so with duplication, we see either extremely tall stature or short stature, and with deletion, we see short stature with these other, um, these other birth defects um, seen with varying degrees of severity. So we went back and looked at some of our azospermic men. In this case, I'm showing you data on men who had duplication in shocks gene. And you can see that they all had abnormal stature. And so here is the height of the individual patients. Three of these men had short stature. Uh, two below the third percentile in height, uh, with one at the tenth percentile. So some of these men were below four feet eleven, um, and right around five feet. Uh, and here we have a patient uh, which is who has a uh, very tall stature here above the ninety-fifth percentile. All of these men had AZF deletions that where the deletion encompassing both AZFB and AZFC. And notably, several of them also had several other abnormalities that um, should, you should be mindful of um, that may be associated with, um, with their um, Y chromosome microdeletions. So the importance for men with Y chromosome microdeletions is that we were able to use a molecular carrier type to confirm Y chromosome microdeletions in subjects, and that shock gene dosage changes were found in about 14% of men with microdeletions. And this was an unrecognized coexisting genomic syndrome that is present in a subset of men with Y chromosome microdeletions. And so again, if you clinically see a patient who has uh, non-obstructive azoospermia and has stature abnormalities, you should immediately think about um, shock syndrome and whether or not you have shock gain or loss affecting stature, as these men have other health issues as well associated with the loss of this gene as well as other genes in this region. Now, there are more pseudoautosomal CNVs to worry about. Now, we used array comparative genomic hybridization, again, a molecular carrier type, to examine men with patients, uh, excuse me, patients with um, either cryptoarchidism, hyperspadius, or spermatogenic failure. And when we did this study to begin with, we found very sort of comfortingly that patients with um, non-obstructive azoospermia and with um, actually with failure of testis determination had microdeletion of the SRY gene telling us that the methodology was very efficient and worked. This is what we would expect to see. 
uh, which would be um, an XY um, an XYY phenotypic female. Um, but what we noted also was that we had a large number of patients um, in this region of the Y Y chromosome. Now this is shown on the X chromosome pseudoautosomal region. It is also present on the Y as well, who had copy number gains um, in this region. And it encompassed just one gene. Um, and as you can see, it's color coded here with blue being patients with cryptorchidism, green being with hypospadias, and purple being patients with hypospadias and cryptorchidism combined. And it's important to remember that cryptorchidism is a very common cause of non-obstructive azoospermia, even when it has been surgically corrected in infanthood. Now, um, we found de novo microduplications um, in our patients. Here we have one with cryptorchidism, one with hypospadias. Both are phenotypically normal. And you see this little green dot right here on the tip of the X chromosome uh, where we have a gain um, of DNA. This simply shows you the probes at higher magnification, which was a duplication, again, it's listed um, as um, XQ28, um, but it is also analogous uh, to the Y chromosome as well. And here we can see fish analysis, which is confirming the presence of three copies. You see three red dots right here of this gene. And a single gene is encoded, which is called VAMP7. Now, we, uh, we went to the literature. Um, and we realized that XQ duplications were very common in patients with genital urinary birth defects. And you see that nearly all of them have some type of uh, cryptorchidism. Many have uh, micropenis uh, as well as hypospadias. And um, we looked at a large number of additional patients, and we found more with um, copy number gains. And this is simply showing you some of the, the RT, uh, QPCR analysis um, that we used to identify these patients. And it accounted for about 3.5% of all hypospadias and cryptorchidism patients. This copy number gain was not present in nearly 9,000 individuals without these birth defects. We were able to make transgenic mice that recapitulated the phenotype. So here you see uh, the mouse scrotum with the testis in the scrotum. Here you see the mouse with over uh, um, uh, copy number gain of VAMP7, which is our, our causative gene with no testis in the scrotum. You can see that the testis are located up near the bladder instead of in the scrotum as seen in the wild type testis. And uh, the vast majority of these mice um, had either uh, unilateral or bilateral cryptoarchidism. And they were virtually all in the inguinal um, region or low abdominal region. None were in the high abdominal region, telling us that, um, that perhaps steroid hormone action was affecting this because the second phase of testicular descent um, is regulated by androgens. Now, we also looked, importantly, at the um, adult mice uh, who had this defect, which, again, we had seen in, in patients with these um, birth defects. And we found that, um, that not only did they have diminished testis weight, um, although seminal vesicles uh, were the same, uh, we found that they had decreased sperm production, um, which again got progressively worse with aging. This is from a young mouse. Motility was decreased, um, and uh, litter size was decreased. And you can see that you have spermatogenic failure that does not look um, like cryptorchidism with large vacuoles and many of the tubules, which again got progressively worse uh, with aging. And, here you're seeing the decreased concentration of sperm uh, in the epididymis from the BAMP7 overexpressing mice. And so we were able to identify then a second pseudoautosomal region on the Y chromosome and the X chromosome where you had gene dosage problems associated with male reproductive defects. 
over expression of VAMP7 due to a copy number gain um, results in about 3.5%, accounts for about 3.5% of the cases of hypospadias and cryptoarchidism. And um, the array of phenotypic abnormalities um, were not just hypospadias and cryptoarchidism, but also micropenis, um, as well as spermatogenic failure. And this was a molecular determinant that disrupted androgen and estrogenic actions in developing and postnatal tissues. And it was a previously unrecognized critical determinant of proper masculization of the human urogenital tract, as well as proper function of the, of the urogenital tract. And so my take-home message um, to you from this uh, webinar today is that the male-specific Y region is critical for uh, sex determination. Uh, the SRY gene is responsible for this, for the completion of spermatogenesis, um, as well as perhaps gender-specific disease differences. Pseudoautosomal regions of the X and Y chromosomes are important for stature, genes regulating sexual differentiation, as well as brain function, which we did not discuss today. So the Y chromosome has many, many important functions, and uh, structural chromosomal abnormalities of the Y chromosome can result in various types of pathologies seen uh, in fertile and in infertile men. Uh, this slide acknowledges my grant support of my laboratory, and I would like to thank you, and I'm talking to you today from the Texas Medical Center, um, and I'm at uh, this site right over here at Baylor College of Medicine. So thank you very much.